Uh, it's really great to have you all here. And I would just pass the word to Jonas von Malda from Catholic University of Leuven to present the roundtable. Thank you very much. Antonella, I think you're first up. So shall I start then? Yep. Okay, thank you, Jonas. Uh, I think uh, that, yes. You should see my screen. Yes. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Elena and uh, the team in uh, Ljubljana to have uh, hosted this uh, event. We are uh, happy to be here and to tell you about uh, a few words about the project where the but valuing of the collections about the missionaries, uh, European missionaries in uh, China have been uh, gathered and the stories told in the various channels activated by Pagode. Pagode is a project uh, funded by the European Commission in the frame of the Connecting Europe Facilities program in the area that is dedicated to Europeana. Europeana is the European Digital Library for European Cultural Heritage and Pagode has opened a new uh, dimension of the collections that are uh, promoted in Europeana because we are, we are looking in Pagode to collections that uh, are hosted in European Cultural Heritage Institutions, archives and museums and um, made them available uh, in Europeana in order to highlight this heritage that is often uh, uh, not uh, fully uh, known by the European uh, citizens uh, and the cultural amateurs, but also to encourage uh, a, a better relationship between uh, Europe and China on a cultural uh, dimension, in the cultural dimension. We think that this has a special meaning also in this moment where the globalization is rethought because of the post-pandemic restart. The consortium is made by the partners that you see in the slide and it is led by the Italian Ministry of Economic Development. I represent the promoter, Sophie will talk on behalf of the photo consortium, the University of Ljubljana is our partner. We have two content providers that are the Belgium Cultural Heritage Research Center and the United Archives that is a photographic archive in uh, uh, Germany and the Postscriptum which is a company in uh, Greece that has started a strong liaison with the cult Chinese cultural heritage institutions and Europeana. Uh, but uh, the consortium does not uh, finish with these uh, partners because uh, we have uh, many associate partners, uh, among which uh, the Leiden University Library, the Slovene Ethnographic Museum, which is a member of uh, this uh, symposium, Museo Virasto, uh, and you will uh, hear from uh, Ismo later on, the Men Benaki Museum, Weltkulturen in Leiden, and Kadok uh, from KU. Uh, this um, gives uh, you an idea of uh, how rich and composite uh, is uh, the uh, scenario of uh, Chinese cultural heritage in Europe and uh, how much uh, we have uh, to say about it. Uh, as uh, I want to elaborate on these contents into uh, different stories that are told through Europeana, in particular an exhibition and a set of editorials that are published on Europeana.eu and you will hear more from Sophie later on. 
uh, in just to give uh, you a few figures, uh, we are uh, providing uh, 10,000 new digitized objects uh, that will be available uh, free of use in Europeana. We are annotating uh, through crowdsourcing activities uh, 2,000 uh, objects that are already in Europeana and that are enriched via uh, specific information that are provided by students in Leuven and in uh, uh, Ljubljana. And we are enriching more than 20,000 digital objects with automatic enrichment and natural language processing techniques. Uh, these are huge numbers. Uh, the project will finish in September, but we will continue to increase these numbers even more. We are expecting to deliver an impact uh, on uh, the amateurs of cultural heritage who will be able to find more content and more uh, information and resources linked to these contents, but also in terms of access to European in general, that is in the scope of our project. I finish here uh, because I know that uh, we have a limited time and uh, I give the floor, uh, I guess, to Ismo for his uh, first presentation and we will uh, uh, hear, uh, uh, we will uh, be in touch again at the end of the presentation of Sophie with all the contacts if you want to know more about the Pagode project. Thank you and uh, Ismo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, and I will... If you don't mind, Ismo, um, perhaps it's easier for the audience if I introduce you and the others first, so... Yes, yes, uh, Everybody knows who's in the panel, if you don't mind. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you, uh, Helena and Antonella, for your introductions, and welcome everyone to this roundtable on digitization and curation of missionary collections in Europe. Um, I am honored to have been asked to, to host this discussion. My name is Jonas van Mulder. I work at Kadok uh, KU Leuven, which will be introduced to you in a minute. Uh, I work there as a researcher and uh, curator with a strong focus on the international components of our collection. And in that capacity, I'm also involved in our partnership with Foto Consortium and uh, Pagode more specifically, hence my presence here. Um, we will move along a rather straightforward formula whereby I will introduce the speakers uh, first and then they will also have the opportunity, uh, as already mentioned, to present themselves and their respective institutions. And then I will pose some questions uh, to allow them to further explain their projects uh, and working practice and uh, perhaps also, also to spark up some uh, discussion. Um, as we are, we are opening this two-day event, um, which I can see in the program is a series of papers on fascinating but also wide-ranging uh, subjects, though I see Jesuit collections, not surprisingly, uh, are clearly a recurring theme. Hence, um, this, this round table is perhaps an appropriate moment to not only introduce Pagode and the three partner institutions, but also to put forward some, some general questions, notions, uh, challenges that are involved in curating uh, missionary collections. So I hope, but I'm confident that we will, will be um, uh, able to make that humble contribution to this interesting program. Um, I suggest that if and someone in the audience has a question, you can also um, put it in the chat so we can pick it up. Or if you wish to ask a question yourself, just raise your hand using the raise your hand uh, function and then uh, you will be given the floor at a suitable moment. But first, um, I have the honor to introduce to you our three panelists. First is uh, Ismo Malinen, who is currently Chief Intendant of the Picture Collections at Museo Virasto, the Finnish Heritage Agency, and is involved as uh, Vice Chairman, if I'm not mistaken, in um, the work of FINA Consortium, the Finnish National platform for museums, archives and libraries for online content publication run by the National Library of Finland. And today, Mr. Malinen will talk uh, on the China collection of the Finnish missionary organization, primarily. 
Next is my own colleague, uh, Ms. Karine Dujardin, currently Head of Public Services and sharing expertise at CABOC, the Interfaculty Documentation and Research uh, Center on Religion, Culture and Society uh, of KU Leuven, KU Leuven. Karine is an expert on the field of uh, mission history, specifically East Asia, building on her PhD on Belgian Franciscan missions in uh, China. She has been involved in the study and the curation of China-related archives held at Kabuk. And in that capacity, she is also involved in the uh, annual Mission and Modernity uh, Research Academy and the associated book series, uh, Leuven Studies in Mission and Modernity at Leuven University Press. Both are steered by Kadok. Thirdly, we have Ms. Natasha vampel sukadolnik Associate Professor and Current Head of the Department of Asian Studies at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Ljubljana. She is uh, the initiator, co-founder and first president of the European Association for Asian Arts in Archaeology and recently has been leading uh, a research project on Asian East Asian collections in Slovenia as well as bilateral projects or a bilateral uh, project involving Slovenia and the US on collecting practices of East Asian uh, objects. So now without further ado, uh, Ismo, I give the floor to you for your introduction and then uh, next up will be Karin and then Natasha. Okay, thank you. And now I will try to share my screen. Let's see, it's here. Now, I hope you all see my slides. Yes. Okay. So, thank you, Jonas and Elena and Maya and you all. It was really nice to be invited to one of these panelists and discussions today. So, uh, I'm uh, from Finnish Heritage Agency and as Jonas introduced me, I'm uh, actually head of our collections and uh, Probably uh, many of you are familiar with Finnish Heritage Agency, uh, but it's a governmental organization and uh, is, uh, was founded already about uh, 1884 or so. And uh, so I'm from our picture collections, which means that we have lots of different kind of images, mostly photographs, but works on paper and drawings and etchings and all kinds of images. In total, we have about 18 million images which have been collected since uh, 1830s. And uh, Finnish Heritage Agency has uh, also museums, for example, uh, National Museum of Finland is one of our museums. So I will be talking and uh, in Pakode we have chosen to digitize and publish uh, only co uh, collections from our picture collections. But uh, when I'm talking about, uh, for example, missionary collections, I'm concentrating on images, but uh, the uh, objects from, uh, for example, missionary organization, they belong to our National Museum and its collections. So this is good to keep in mind. And uh, I will uh, show some uh, basic facts about our missionary collections and its origin and some images for our discussion to give you some thoughts and Jonas, uh, they might help to bring some ideas about your future <laughs> questions. Uh, but uh, uh, let's start. I will because I think uh, it's uh, good to know these basic facts about uh, Finnish Evangelical Lutheran Mission because it tells and explains quite a lot about our collections. And uh, for all of you, I will be talking more about this film collection and uh, even some uh, other our interesting China collection next week in this first Pakode festival event. So you, I hope you all can join and ask more questions about 
for example, our film collection and China collection in general. But uh, so uh, there are some uh, basic facts about this film. And I will, when I'm talking about Finnish Evangelical Lutheran Mission, I will use this term film. So it was founded already in 1850s and first was uh, went to Namibia and Southern Africa. So this is just actually some two interesting images and perhaps this can give some uh, thoughts about our discussion about, for example, ethics later. And of course, this kind of images, we have lots of them in also in China collections. But uh, to China, this film uh, went in early uh, 20th century and first missionary station was founded in 1902. And it's a still working organization. They have today about uh, 30 countries and they have actions and uh, work around the world. And uh, so uh, they started to collect and photograph uh, already in late 19th century and they have even had even one own museum, but this museum was closed and collections were donated to Finnish Heritage Agency in 2015. So since then they have been in our collections and in total this collection includes about 160,000 images. So lots and lots of images around the world. Many of them are from China. So uh, there's uh, some basic facts about uh, uh, film in China. So they were in China uh, till uh, early 50s, but most of this work was uh, carried in uh, 19 10 till 1940s, early 1940s, because of this war period and difficulties in China. And so, 53, this uh, last missionary left China, but uh, they still carry on their work in China and neighboring areas today. So, we have also images from, let's say, 1990s and quite new images also from China. And uh, the area where they mo mostly work was uh, Hunan province in central uh, China. And Yinxi was the key station for film for the whole period they were in China. And actually, uh, this is uh, how they describe their selecting Yinxi and Hunan for their work, because they wanted to work in an area where no missionary work had yet been done, but of course there were some Nordic missionaries and well, other missionary organization working nearby. And let's say, so uh, there's some images of there from this collection. And as I think all uh, missionary collection includes images of daily work and these missionaries, but uh, also, these Finnish missionaries, they documented the area and people living in China and political events. And of course, this gives uh, for us some questions and need uh, extra knowledge to interpret and uh, put information about these uh, images. This one is uh, just, I chose this because uh, it has an original text, it, it's called Buddhist Monks, and it's, it was taken in Hanko, which is uh, actually Wuhan today, in 1902. And as you all can see, there's lots of hints that what kind of monks, monks they are, but perhaps this is just an introduction for Jonas for our discussion. What kind of information you need to catalog and put information and interpret this kind of images. So, uh, and there's some uh, more, 
I would say normal images of their daily work. These kind of images we have a lot about uh, their uh, social work and teaching and hospitals and of course missionary work and daily work of and pleasure time and of course there's lots of question about digitizing and publishing but i think uh, we can discuss how we digitize and how we choose and how we publish our collections and through which platforms and how they can be used later in our discussions. So I think this was a very short introduction to our collections, but let's see how it goes with your questions and discussions. But let's hope that this was good starting point for our discussion. So thank you. And I think I will stop sharing. So. Exactly. Thank you, Ismo, for already hinting at some of the questions that we might get to uh, in a few minutes. So now I invite you, Karim, uh, to share your screen and uh, present our collection. Karin, you're muted, so if you're saying something, that's why we can't hear you, but we can see your presentation. No, no please, uh, you have to unmute yourself that, uh, with the microphone. Or Dunya, perhaps you can help out. I think that is a okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, I'm already at uh, the China collection at the moment, because I, I, I choose the wrong. I have the wrong. Okay. Now we can hear you well. It's okay. Yeah. Slideshow. Okay. So I think we can start. So I will try to be give you some brief information on our China collections at Kaduk. Um, Slide show from the beginning. Yeah, it doesn't. Yes, okay. I have to. Uh, so oh, I have. Rechts onderaan, rechts onderaan is er zo een, uh, een, een icoontje van een, een dia scherm. Nog uh, eentje opzij, nog eentje opzij naar rechts. Nee, naar de uh, andere, ja. Okay, okay, ja, okay. Yeah. okay, sorry, yeah. Um, Yes, I, I have, to, first I want to tell you something about um, uh, CADOC, eh? CADOC as a documentation and research center. And I think it's maybe important to tell you about our mission so that you can understand how we work with the collection. So we are an interfaculty center of the KU Leuven, so which means that uh, aspect of research is important in, in our mission, but we are also a heritage institution recognized by the Flemish community, recognized and subsidized by the Flemish community, which means also that we have some specific, um, it, it has some specific impact on how we work with the collection and how we, let's say important in that context is that we, um, the, let's say the, Public oriented valorization is a crucial issue in, in that element. So here you have some pictures of Kadok. So when you come to Leuven, we, we are happy to invite you eh, to see, uh, on, the, on the left um, here, uh, you see um, the cloister or the, the monastery or of the, the Franciscans. That's where we, we live now, where we have our documentation center. And it's actually on, on that, um, on that congregation that I, I did my PhD. So they have been active in China since uh, 1872 until the 1950s. But important is the picture down, uh, which is the stack. Sorry, I have to go 
page up. Um, I think the picture illustrates um, the amplitude, I think, of the, the collections we have. So we started in 97 and uh, we have like 44 kilometers of stacks. Missionary collections is part of, uh, of, of our collection. We also have collections on civil society and individual archives. So, But the third picture, I think, is also important in, in this context because it's Lias. So on the left, you have our physical depository, but on the right hand side, you have our digital depository and uh, preservation and sustainability is, is very important in, in, that, uh, in that context. So I told you we are, um, we, we are uh, part of the an interfaculty center of the, of, the, of the university, so the research element is important, but we're also a heritage institute which is uh, subsidized by the Flemish community. So what you see here on the, on the right hand side are the, the, the quali qualification labels. So the qual we, are, we have a, a quality label of uh, archive and heritage library. And that has the implication that these are the five functions which are important for, for, for subsidization and for, for, for the subsidies we have to collect and and this preserve, but we also have to do research on the collection. So that's important to, to get the qualification label and to get the, subs the subsidies. Uh, I already mentioned this uh, presentation. So public oriented valorization is a crucial element in, in, the, in our mission and also in the policy of the Flemish community. I think related to cultural heritage, uh, the Flemish community has a rather innovative perspective on, on that heritage. You can see that in, in the, uh, the five functions uh, which are part uh, of the cultural heritage decree. And the fifth function participation is actually a new element, which is uh, in also in, an element in the discussion here. So I, I think it was important for me to mention this uh, in order to, to help you to better understand how we work and how we present our collection. So I come to the second to most important part of this presentation, the China collections in our, uh, in our institution. And we have, let's say, three different aspects, archives, library, audiovisual, but we, have, we do not uh, keep the mu museum objects. So, so a CADOC is not a museum. The archives, um, as I told you, so the the, uh, the religious institutes are, are crucial, and so we have uh, the archives of the Jesuits, Bel Belgium Jesuits, French Jesuits, so uh, Franciscans. So that's are really huge archives, um, important yeah, from the 19th uh, century until the present time, uh, and these congregations had missionary activities in started missionary activities in the late 19th century and then up until the recent time and uh, that's all preserved in, in, in these archives. We also keep um, archives of missionary specific missionary congregations like for instance uh, CICM which is a Belgian congregation which was founded especially to start missionary activities in China. So this is very specific uh, related to, to this, uh, this theme and uh, which, yes, that's a very uh, precious archive, which is uh, uh, preserved at CADOC and uh, so which is accessible to the public. And then we have some files uh, in, we also have files in, from Vatican archives and, and they also uh, are some files on China. Here you have an ID. Eh? So, um, and, and of of how you, you can you can look in our cat, cat, uh, in our catalog and, and look for for these archives and how you can find them back. So here you have an example of the geographical maps maps, for instance. Uh, that's a precious collection within uh, CICM. Um, and uh, they're they're all digitized and they are open to the public. So in open access and on on every uh, region in, in China where they have been working, uh, they created maps, the missionary created maps. And they also, uh, yes, they are 
geographical information, but also cultural information. So they are very precious sources, interesting sources. A second part, uh, besides the archives, which is most extensive, um, is the heritage library. And I think there are different parts in it. The, the, let's say the main focus of our heritage library is on gray literature. This means that we do not focus um, especially on the, let's say, scientific publications, um, but like on the, the sources, the primary sources, like uh, publications made by missionaries, brochures used in the missions, periodicals eh, used uh, in the missionary action um, of the missionaries in, in, in Europe, in Belgium, uh, but also um, periodicals uh, focusing on a, on a Chinese audience. We have school books, uh, liturgical collection, uh, publications, collect children's books, for instance, this collection of children's books, actually that's interesting for the perception of the West on China. They are in Dutch eh, or in French, but they have also very interesting images, which can be uh, very, yes, interesting in, in this in this topic, in this research. But uh, I, I said the main focus is not on scientific publications, but we still have some interesting collections related to China. Uh, here I mentioned the Mythological Weeks of Leuven, which is uh, actually a scientific perception on missiological of on mission work eh, in, 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 in that period. I also mentioned the Scripta collection of the CICM fathers. There were a number of uh, missionary scientists and, and their collection, their publications, uh, their archives are preserved at Cado. Okay? We have uh, Serreus, we have uh, missionary sinologists, uh, anthropologists. So also related to, to science, ethnography, anthropology, uh, sinology, uh, our archives, our collection, our heritage library uh, do have uh, yeah, interesting uh, collections of interesting um, topics for research. Here we have a small example. We have also the publication in Korean, for instance, in Islamic, uh, Arabic languages. But then I think um, a third collection or part of our collection with this very precious, but uh, there are a lot of, um, let's say, challenges related to metadata, etc. is the audiovisual collection. So each religious institution has also uh, a part of uh, visual archives and um, there are pictures, there are albums, interesting, especially uh, the catechetical wall chart collection of Van Dijk, for instance, it's a very precious collection. They, he, he made like a kind of integration be between Western and Eastern um, images eh, on the Bible, etc. So, and they, uh, we, have, we have that uh, at Kadok. We have a magic lantern collection of 20,000 items. We have a film collection. But then there are also some independent collection. What I mentioned here is uh, how I started my career at CADOC. So an oral history collection. I started working at CADOC interviewing all living Belgian missionaries at that time. So, and uh, of course, unfortunately the language is, is Dutch, but uh, it's, I mean, they were very interesting sources, primary sources, which are preserved at CADOC, also digitized. And, there is a poster collection, there is a devotional print collection. So just to give you to give you some ideas, it's an example of these prints, eh, the Van Dijk prints. But just to finish, I wanted to, to, to give here some characteristics, to men mention some characteristics uh, of our collection, chi of our China collection. The extensiveness, the richness, I think, the multi-perspectivity, the, the, it's not only on religion, it's on uh, culture, society, politics, uh, ethnography, etc. The diversity in content and language, the relevance, I think uh, this, is a, this is a masterpiece collection. Uh, but there are also a lot, some, a lot of sensitive uh, issues. And eh? there's uh, a China collection, a missionary collection is, is uh, came into existence in a 
colonial, semi-colonial context. So that's already an issue of, of these sensitivities. But it's a collection, as I told you, and so it's a, I, I, in, in my opinion, it's a masterpiece collection. There are challenges and opportunities eh, in related to administration, contextualization, research, digitization, the element of shared heritage presentation. So, but I think these elements will be discussed uh, uh, later on. So thank you for. Thank you very much, Karin. Um, Natasha, you're up. I don't know if you have a uh, slide presentation as well. Yes, thank you. I will just share my screen as well. Perfect. So here it is. I hope that you all can see it. Yep. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would also like to um, I'm first to say that I'm very happy to be part of this very interesting round table. And I would like to thank uh, first Jonas for moderating uh, and also to my colleagues from the Department of Asian Studies, Maya, Helena, Dunia, and as well to my colleagues from the Pagoda project uh, where we closely worked together in the last year to ingest um, objects to Europana. So I'm going to talk, my presentation will be a little bit different, uh, not so much on the structure of the archives and, and, and the workflow because due to some very specific social political situation, as well as many other reasons, most of such collections or non-European or East Asian collections, missionary collections have been mostly, have been forgotten and mostly left in the storage, uh, somehow condemned to a dormant life. And only recently we started to work on these collections. So actually just like three years ago, we started with the national project. So I hope that this kind of round table would be also very, enriching for us to learn more about uh, the workflow and to also talk about future plans, how to work on this collection. So I will mostly focus on the content. So I would present the Peter Baptiste Turk collection, uh, which is kept in the Slovene Ethnographic Museum and uh, who is also, I mean, which is also the associate partner of the Pagode project. And some of, uh, of the objects will be ingested to Europana, even though not the objects from the Turk collection, but another one. Anyway, but we hope that also to the collection will be um, uh, um, will be digitalized and with the continuation of the Pagoda project uh, with this um, Pagoda the sequel uh, ingested to Europana as well. So uh, there are uh, there were uh, there are several missionary collections in different Slovenian museums or institutions. And this is the uh, Father Peter Baptist Struck that I'm going to talk uh, about more about it. And um, in addition to Turk, there was there were Jozef Keret and Andrei Maitsen. Uh, they were all missionaries in the southern part of China in the 20th century, where they also collected some uh, objects, uh, mostly religious objects. But uh, Keret and Andrei Maitsen they also collected other types of, of objects, which is actually very interesting. And the uh, collection of Keret and Maiten are both kept at the Salesians Museum near Ljubljana, uh, but the collection of Turk is kept in the uh, Slovenian Ethnographic Museum. It is also the most interesting, the most re uh, remarkable. But before I introduce it, I would just like to mention another uh, also very important uh, Jesuit missionary from the Slovene ethnic territory. So, although we don't have any objects that he would collect, but some very important letters and other arch archive materials have been preserved and also uh, kind of rediscovered recently in various archives across Europe, so, uh, in, as well as China and Taiwan, for example, in Austria, Italy, Vatican, Belgium, uh, England and Slovenia, China, uh, uh, Peking and Taiwan in the National Palace Museum. Uh, and despite his very remarkable position in Beijing in the 18th century, uh, until recently, very little was known about him. So this is Ferdinand Augustin Hallerstein, uh, whose Chinese name uh, was Liu Songling. And um, he spent 35 years at the imperial court of the Qianlong Emperor and was nearly 30 years the head of the Imperial Board of Astronomy, uh, where he uh, so, um, contributed a lot also to the cultural exchange between Europe and China. Uh, soon after his arrival in Beijing, he assisted another important Jesuit, Ignatius Kugler, in revising this classical astronomical treatise. 
And uh, he also further took the leadership in contriving the terrestrial and celestial globes and helped to design the most impressive astronomic instrument, uh, a new equatorial armory sphere, uh, which is now uh, with which they made a very precise astronomic observation and uh, which is still now um, situated at the old observatory in Beijing. Although it was plundered uh, during the Boxer Rebellion and sent to, to Germany, but then after the second war, or the first world war, uh, sent back to China. And he also uh, became um, quite known uh, due to his experiments with inductive electricity. He calculated the geographical lengths of Beijing, and he was the first to make the precise calculation of total population of China for the years of uh, 1716, 1761. And he also made the map of the of the Macau and also the map of the Mulan in Manjuria, which was the uh, Qianlong's hunting region, uh, and so on. So, as mentioned, he left mostly written legacy, written legacy in the forms of letters, scientific works published in then renowned journals, uh, and uh, which are very interesting because they also talk not not so not only about the Jesuit activities, but of course of climate, uh, animal world statistic, geography, and so on. So uh, I do hope that in the future there will also be the possibility to kind of create a database and gather all these different materials that are now scattered in various archives across Europe, uh, China, and uh, in Taiwan. Okay, so now let me uh, continue with the introduction of uh, Peter Baptiste Turk collection. Uh, he, um, uh, let me just briefly say some uh, of his background. So he was born in 1874 in a very small village in the southeastern part of Slovenia. And after six years of collegium, he entered Franciscan order and already in 1901, he was on a ship on his way to China. And after one month of sailing, he arrived to Hankou, Wuchang, which is today's uh, Wuhan, where he stayed until his death uh, in 1944. Uh, there he was very active, uh, immediately started to learn Chinese to be able to com communicate, of course, with the locals, uh, um, built few schools, churches, uh, pharmacy, he even taught Latin and mathematics, and he uh, he also kept, uh, maintained a rich correspondence with his colleagues in, in Slovenia at that time and even published a series of articles from China in the then Slovenian Catholic, uh, Catholic journal, where he also described of many uh, other interesting uh, things and situations that happened in China during that time. For example, he uh, uh, wrote a length report on the death of the Emperor Guangxi and um, Dowager Cixi and talked about the fear and the uh, situation that's time in, in that time in China. But although uh, 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 his attitude towards Chinese religious practices were rather, was rather critical and disapproving, which is clearly seen in his writing, he collected uh, many Buddhist and Taoist uh, uh, statues and other religious objects uh, of popular religion and sent them to then a uh, museum in, in, in Carniola, Provincial Museum of Carniola. So in 1912 and 1913, since he sent all this material to the museum, uh, but uh, <clears throat> mostly all of the objects mostly came from the southern region, from Wuhan and from Shanghai. Uh, but when the Slovene Ethnographic Museum was founded in 1923, uh, all, uh, I mean, all non-European or most of the non-European objects were transferred to the ethnographic museum. So the tour collection was also transferred to the ethnographic museum, where it's still now kept. <clears throat> uh, and uh, you can see uh, still um, uh, the back or, or the bottom of the objects are still labeled with this kind of labels with his name, the date, and even his own notes, which is very interesting. So on some of the back of this of his items, we have his own notes. So uh, his collection, uh, we, uh, it, uh, so the collection is not so much about the images or photos, but mostly of the objects. So his collections includes various types of religious objects, such as you can see here, like such as a uh, bell, thunderbolt, ceremonial drums, and uh, uh, this kind of vajra, which is a kind of ritual, uh, ritual object, ritual weapon to use in the ritual objects, and. Uh, uh, also, uh, he collected uh, quite a lot of Buddhist statues, 
as mentioned, also other Taoist and other religious, popular religion statues, uh, they are all made of different material of bronze, of porcelain, of, of wood. And this is, for example, the uh, one of the Buddhist statues um, where it shows this uh, cross-footed Buddha sitting on the lotus seat uh, with the mixture of Chinese and Indian iconographic elements. So his face we already see is Chinese, but hairstyle with curls and shisha and even the clothes are still Indian. Uh, here are also some other statues um, that need further examination. As mentioned, we, uh, we just started, actually we even haven't started to examine his collection yet, but hopefully there will be opportunity to do it in the next, in the coming years. So uh, now we have to identify, confirming the dating and other relevant data. Uh, sometimes Turk wrote an, an explanation of the images himself inscribed on the back. For example, for this deity he wrote, that is a kind of Malik Wei Tung carried by bonds on his back to chase away evil spirits from local houses. Not, not only Turk, but also other Slovenian missionaries often referred to Buddhist monks with the word bonds. Bonds, which according to Turk's own explanation derives from the Japanese Buso, Bosan, which is Buddhist priest or, or monk. Uh, and here is another, um, another deity and his own explanation, which he wrote is uh, Luanze Nyan a uh, kind of um, uh, female deity to which pagan woman, as he wrote, worship for marital happiness. As, as what is also interesting in this small, small uh, statues is that quite a lot of them has this hole inside the statue, which was a kind of container for, for relics and other objects. So there was a custom of placing materials inside the statue, such as organs made of silk, bronze mirrors, ashes, sometimes even manuscripts or fragrant woods, medical substances and so on. So, so to enliven the statue and make the deity present, so to speak, give its chance a kind of soul. So most of these uh, statues in Tur collection also have such a hole on the back, but they are usually empty. And uh, this is also uh, what I found quite particular uh, and interesting in his collection. There are also some of these kinds of uh, uh, objects, so rich or spiritual tablets, such as this one dedicated to the deities of happiness and fortune kind of mythological figure uh, worshipped in Chinese folk region, uh, as well as in the, as well as in Taoism. So altogether, he sent to the museum uh, around 160 objects. As mentioned, they are now housed in the Slovene Ethnographic Museum. And uh, this, the, the collection has not been systematically studied yet, has not been digitized yet. So we hope, as mentioned, that we will be able to do this in the coming years within our project or within the continuation of this project. So thank you very much for, for, for your attention. Thank you so much for your introductions, Ismo, Karin and Natasha. Um, it's obvious that there is a lot more to tell and I'm sure you will be able to do so in the course of this conversation. Um, I myself will skip the first introductory question I had in mind, saving it for later maybe, and moving on um, immediately to a more specific practical question in order to stimulate the exchange of experience. And, and this question deals with uh, something that you, all three of you have mentioned in your presentations is the, um, the issue of examination and identification and contextualization. Um, I wondered if you could, could tell me and the audience a bit more about your um, experiences, if any, with engaging external expertise, uh, researchers, students, uh, locally, abroad, for generating metadata. I mean, to establish um, historical and cultural context. Do you seek linguistic assistance? Uh, do you have professional partners to do so? Um, do you perhaps maintain contacts with uh, missionary congregations or organizations themselves or their representatives today? Um, if I may, Ismo, uh, you refer to this issue uh, while illustrating or while showing the alleged uh, Buddhist monk's photograph. Uh, and you mentioned specifically this issue of how to, to cope with this lack of information. 
Um, could you tell us maybe a bit on how you would uh, deal with this situation in general and this collection um, specifically? Okay, yeah. So this is a good example because, uh, of course, uh, we ourselves have uh, some basic information about our collections and even China collection. But uh, first of all, uh, uh, we have a quite big ethnographic uh, picture collection in our collections, but uh, no expert on uh, ethnographic. We have an uh, expert on Finnish ethnology, but no, of, for example, China expert. But because uh, National Museum of Finland is, of course, part of our organization and they have their uh, ethnological collections, and actually two experts, one in uh, uh, East Asia and one about, actually, uh, they have at least three experts on ethnological objects and, uh, well, history. So we were able to discuss with them, for example, about this one uh, image about Buddhist, Buddhist monks in Hanko. And uh, we had, for example, discussion about ontologies we are using because this is uh, actually it's an, another topic, but uh, it's really interesting to know, uh, know <coughs> that, uh, for example, about this one image, we re realized that in this ontology we are using, they there were some not so modern uh, keywords which would be suitable for example used uh, in uh, putting metadata about these image. But basically this information about a uh, situation that we can use uh, expertise from a national museum, it's good. But uh, more important is, for example, about this uh, film collection that we have good relationship with this film organization working today. And uh, volunteers, uh, old um, well for example one we have one volunteer who was actually she was uh, head of communication at film so she is uh, really precious and really important for us because she with help of her old colleagues has went through about one uh, ten thousand images putting information, collecting information, uh, talking with uh, old uh, colleagues and co-workers at FELM. So she has helped us a lot because without her help, we would know much, much less about our collection. So this relationship, existing relationship with scholars and this organization, it's key to our success. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I think that uh, continuity of ex uh, expertise within a certain project or within um, uh, a certain curation project of a, of, of a specific archives or collection is very important. And I think, uh, Karin, you're in a perfect position working in Kadok for some time already, but really starting off with, with um, talking to missionaries and then eventually studying uh, missionary collections, archives from maps to uh, audiovisual um, uh, pieces as well. Um, of course, I know a part of the answer already, but um, how does this work in Kadok uh, when it comes to um, metadata um, individual pieces, but also collections in general? Uh, thank you, Jonas. So indeed, as you told, um, in, in Kanok, I think important is the integration of uh, the heritage, the heritage perspective and the research perspective so that we try to 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 generate uh, expertise also in house for for the, the metadata. I think that's uh, that's one aspect. But I think also an important element is uh, the fact that most archives um, or private archives. So that means that they are 
they, they, they still belong to the religious community and the, the, the responsible of the res, uh, religious community has to uh, give uh, access. So if, if, it, uh, if the, the, the files, the archives are used by third persons, they have to agree on, on that use. So, and that means that we still get in touch with, um, let's say, the heritage community with uh, religious institution. And that's especially helpful, I think, for the metadata of the audiovisual collection. So for the archives, we have our, uh, we have our specialists and, okay, we do not want um, the missionaries to deselect eh, the most delicate or the, eh, so it's better that, that we can, we can get the, the whole archive and then a professional will, will just, uh, metadata that that's I think that's that's important but for the audiovisual collection I think uh, that's very important the uh, the help we get from um, yes members of the uh, the institution who can who can help in the the metadata and then maybe a third element which I wanted to mention is um, an, an example for instance there was a, a PhD student from China uh, who was interested in the China collection, but uh, yes, of course, and I think the language problem, that's uh, something which is yeah, very crucial in, in, in this context. If you want to, to make your collection accessible in, in an international environment, uh, I mean, yes, the, the Dutch or the French language is not uh, most interesting. So we need a translation into, in, into English and into Chinese. And um, the PhD student, he, he did that for part of our collection. So, he, uh, so we have uh, 300 uh, titles who have been translated to, to English and to, to Chinese as a, card, as a kind of participative uh, commitment of a Chinese PhD student. So I think that's also an example. So we work on different levels, but uh, as the, let's say the challenge is so huge, eh, it's, uh, you have to work with uh, at different levels and with different uh, methodologies, so. Thank you, Karin. Um, Natasha, um, by the way, it struck me how these, um, these, these statues, uh, were very similar, and the practice of, of having, having relics or, or texts in them was very similar to medieval practices in, in Catholic, uh, uh, in the Catholic tradition. So that's that that struck me. Uh, I just wonder; it's maybe a detailed question, but um, there is information on the back very often, descriptions. I wondered how you deal with that information. Um, obviously, you can take it at face value, but it holds. Uh, context, it holds an identification, but how do you context, contextualize it? How do you, you fact check them by, uh, by, by a way of saying? How do you do that? Yeah, so um, as mentioned, we actually haven't started to work on this collection yet, but, but of course um, uh, we, will, we, will have to, we will have to check very carefully first his, his, uh, his inscriptions on the back, so to understand what does he mean, because it's also very interesting to see his understanding and what kind of images of, or, or, or what kind of status he was collecting with the aim to send to the museum, because it was not his own collections. But on the other side, of course, uh, we would need to also check with some other facts and, uh, and details about, this, about the statues, what kind of material and what would they would represent and to contextualize it within a wider, um, broader context of that time society and uh, the, the Chinese religion, Buddhism, Taoism, and so on. So here we also, um, we, as mentioned, we work on these East Asian collections, but also, of course, uh, we cooperate closely with the museums or museum professionals in Slovenia who hold these kind of collections. But since the material is very uh, um, wide and broad, there are many different types of objects, not only religious objects, but uh, lacquer objects, uh, albums, forth in ceramic and so on. Uh, we also cooperate with uh, international and other scholars in this world, so we would invite and then uh, discuss um, and try to, uh, to get um, involved experts on this field. So we closely work, for example, with the University of Zurich and um, for, for um, 
for lacquer object with the Museum of Lacquer Art in Minster and so on. Uh, so for this part, for the missionary collections, uh, we, uh, we will have to, of course, deal with this issue as well in the future. And some of our colleagues in the department um, uh, also specialize, for example, in Chinese religion, anthropology, and so on. So uh, and because we all, all come from different fields, from Chinese, Japanese studies, but at the same time from other disciplines. So in this kind is uh, very helpful. But we would all, we also engage in uh, this work. Um, uh, which I've, uh, uh, Karin already mentioned, but also in our part, I think this is one of the very uh, interesting points and very important. Uh, so we also include MA and PhD students. Um, uh, they collaborate as part of their academic courses. And I have to say that their work is really amazing and they do a very thorough research on individual objects and they are as students of Chinese and Japanese or Korean studies. They are able to contextualize. So to put the objects into a broader context and to also discuss about the social political factors that inspired or uh, dictated the creation of these objects. So and uh, very interesting thesis came out of this co uh, of such a uh, cooperation. And uh, I, I'm also very happy to say that also students, they kind of adopt the objects because they choose the object that they like the most. And then they are all done talking, oh, this is my object. So I'm going to write about this and this. And they even um, were engaged in the preparation for the exhibition. So, uh, and it, of course, was very proud so that they saw their own objects, so to say their own objects in the exhibit with their own analysis and the research work. So, yes, we, of course, uh, have to collaborate with uh, different people. And I think that this kind of interdisciplinary approach is very important. Um, also not, uh, as you mentioned, this is a very similar practice in the Catholic um, region here in the Middle Ages. So it's also to, to have colleagues who understand the European history and the European different, different situations you know, to make this kind of, um, also to understand the cultural context and exchanges uh, in this part. So yeah. Thank you, Natasha. I think you very well summarized um, what kind of collaborative and interdisciplinary work heritage as a kind of body of studies and practices actually allows for uh, in comparison with more traditional uh, individual um, research or approaches to um, such collections or artifacts. Um, eventually, the ambition of all of your endeavors is in this matter is to make available these sources and these artifacts for consultation, for research, or simply to marvel at. Um, hence, I wanted to ask you to elaborate a bit more on your view on public uh, outreach. You already uh, hinted at that, of course. Um, how would you describe your primary target audience, uh, if there is any such thing for you? both at a local and a national and beyond uh, level and beyond that and in what shape or form do you uh, do that or intend to do that i wonder for example if you maintain or foresee relationships with local source communities that this heritage or in one way or another relates to or if there are any sources that uh, in your collections that have the potential for such uh, collaboration it's kind of an open question Yeah, perhaps I can. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. So, of course, this uh, public outreach is really important, but uh, we mainly focus on, uh, well, Finnish community because uh, Finnish, uh, well, heritage is, of course, our main target. And uh, this is actually a good uh, idea or actually question to us that how can we deal with, uh, well, for example, Chinese, uh, a small Chinese community living in Finland, what kind of, uh, well, use they could have from this collection or information or get information and could we, for example, use them to help to get more information uh, and background to this collection. But, uh, yeah, and this, uh, how we do this outreach and, uh, uh, well, can use and can, how these communities can use our collections is, is of course 
through our platforms and publishing our dig digitized collections. Uh, so this is uh, mainly done by using uh, our Finna and of course Europeana is really important. But I think, Karin, you mentioned this language or language barriers. This is a really big issue when we are talking about China collections. And I think in that, for example, our uh, small China, Chinese communities could help because, for example, when we are going through this uh, film collection, there's lots of uh, texts put on these uh, images in China, Chinese. And for example, none of us uh, could understand or could uh, use Chinese texts. So we have to rely on what these missionaries put on these images. And of course, we could get more and more information about these images if we could read this original text in Chinese. And perhaps this is one way to, in future to use these local communities. And of course, publishing them gives uh, uh, well, a way for all uh, interested to get to use these images and give us feedback and more information about. So this public outreach, it's really, really it's key to use these collections and include this more information on them. Kevin, you mentioned the, the Red Lantern project. Um, maybe this is, is, is an appropriate moment to talk about that, that particular project. I think. Uh, yes, thank you, Jonas. Um, as I already mentioned, public outreach, so um, public oriented valorization is one of the core business of CADOC. So it's uh, part of our mission statement. So, and we have been working on that since the beginning. So with exhibitions, eh, so then you go with the collection. There has been there have been several exhibitions on the mission collection on the mission collection of China related to several projects. Uh, but we have also, and that's what uh, Jonas is talking. Uh, so that's an ongoing. Let's say that's an ongoing project. So we are doing that all the time, and we are trying. Uh, to, to, to think how we can do better or, or we try to new, we, we take new initiatives. And an in, interesting uh, example, I think, was um, the project on the Red Lantern, so which is a movie on the Boxer uprising in a uh, silent movie in 19, uh, ni made in 1919. And it was a project uh, together with Cinematic. So where this movie uh, was preserved and kept, and they asked Kadok um, to give input on the Boxer Uprising, because we have, uh, yes, in our China collection, a, a lot of documentation on that. And of course, the issue is the Boxer Uprising, and which is a very sensitive issue uh, for also from the Chinese perspective um, and Western, Eastern, perception on 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 that uh, yes uh, period of, of of controversy let's say and um, so we did um, we made we made our public uh, a public event so the, the 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 movie was shown to the public then um, Chinese students uh, studying in in, in 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 Leuven at the time were had a preview of the of the movie and they were asked to to react on that and uh, so and it, me as uh, as I did a PhD on China I, I gave an introduction on the let's say the multi perspectivity eh? so of 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 that uh, yeah, and and I showed uh, also the the historical sources so. I, I use, let's say, the the heritage which was available in Kadok on that Boxer, Boxer uprising uh, to 
to present uh, different perspectives uh, from a historical point of view, but also there was an econ there is an economic vision, there is a political, there is a cultural difference, etc. So uh, yeah, there is a. I have a presentation, but maybe it's it would take us too far, Jonas, to show that. But uh, I I'm don't know. Afraid so. Yes, but but I think if anyone is interested, um, they can obviously contact you. I think that's a good solution for for now. But I think that was a good example. We were happy about also there was a positive feedback. It was a, a fine way uh, to 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 work with heritage in 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 this in this context. But may I have also preparing for for this uh, for this session. I have also maybe another idea or, or another element that I would like to mention here, um, because I think we did a lot. Uh, related to public oriented valorization uh, in the past, but what is a, a, a challenge right now for the moment is to, to, to reach out to a more international public. So like uh, the Chinese community and, and, and that's, uh, of course, there is a language issue, but I think what has to be mentioned, and I think then uh, which, what is important, which is an opportunity, I think when we could, get more financial means, more funds for digitization, it would be easier to reach out to, to that inter, international community. So we have been appealing to the Flemish community for a specific fund uh, on the, the digitization of, of uh, shared heritage, because that's, of course, that's the central issue. This is Western heritage eh, from the perspective of the missionary, but this is also Eastern heritage from the perspective of the, 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 the local community. And uh, of course, these archives in, in Flemish, they are not in maybe no use eh, just to, to, to digitize or, or, but there is also the audiovisual collection, which is, I mean, there are parts of the collection which are very useful also and very interesting also for, for Eastern researchers. And I think that's a, a, a big challenge. And I, what I want to mention here in, in related to the element of public outreach is also, I think, the, the diplomatic potential of cultural heritage. So I think, um, Yes, I think that's a challenge for us. And I think uh, looking at the future, that's uh, a way I think we, we, we want to go, a step which we, we have to, to take together in a, in a European context, I think, because it's a big challenge, but uh, there is a lot of potential in, in, in this, I think, so. Thank you very much, Karim. Um, Natasha, if you don't mind, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, um, from your work in a more muse museological context, um, do you see any differences in dealing with, with these kinds of ethical issues related to representation in comparison to uh, more archival contexts? I'm thinking, for example, of, of, of the tension between displaying artifacts without overly aestheticizing them in a way that, that eclipses a more critical approach. I wonder if you have any ideas about um, about that. Uh, sorry, you mean about so displaying the the objects with regard yeah. to the ethical issues, or yeah, the the tension that I sometimes myself feel when I make prepare a project myself or as a visitor in the museum, the tension between a kind of an aesthetic experience of the piece in relation to what Karin mentions. Um, uh, mentioned when she talked about the Bakhtar Rebellion, uh, more sensitive, culturally sensitive issues that require a more critical approach. Um, do you see any tension between aesthetics and that critical approach, or do you think that museums can be uh, a place that uh, allows for such a, like, let's say, a double uh, approach to these images, to these artifacts? Uh, yes, certainly. I think that um, 
I mean, the, the responsibility of the museums, I mean, of, of, of other institutions that kept different kinds of this type of materials, regardless where they came from, is to treat them properly, to document them properly, and also to open them publicly to all other audience. So not only to keep them in the museum depots or forget about them or lose them and so on, but uh, it's their responsibility so that everyone who would be interested should be opened and uh, um, with that, we can all, also raise public awareness that uh, what kind of materials we have and this culture exchanges in, in, in here. It was a very uh, sensitive, actually, situation because you mentioned this one in Slovenia, because uh, um, after the Second World War, there was this communist, uh, communist policy of confiscating items from noble families and they put them in the federal a collecting center, which was were then dis, um, disseminated between different museums. So, uh, and one of such collections in in an Italian regional museum totally came from this kind of center, and it was a kind of taboo until recently because um, the curator doesn't want to talk about this. They were afraid uh, of um, uh, connections with the the last owners. Even now, it's uh, very difficult to do the the research on the provenance because. This confiscation was uh, very um, uh, says very little about uh, the provenance. They only write carpet or wardrobe or porcelain and something like this. So my colleague actually will talk more about it in the afternoon session uh, about these kind of sensitive issues. But certainly, it is our responsibility to show to 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 show to find the most accurate information with this one and to display it. In, in a way that would be available to everybody, to the local community, to the international community. And in this, in this is also our main aim of our project in Slovenia. So, so, uh, so to, to create a national database on East Asian objects kept in various museums. And my colleague uh, already put the link to this database in the chat, so you're welcome to visit it. Um, with which we would like to also kind of establish this theoretical or methodological approaches how to treat the subjects to be better preserved because you know due to the, because they were often displaced and with long-term storage in museums and without proper documentation without proper treatment often led to their damage but we would also like to raise the awareness that they are not just a kind of strange or exotic items that have nothing to do with our culture because uh, to show that these are actually our national heritage, they are not only Chinese or Japanese heritage on, on European, but they are also European heritage and um, or better to say kind of global heritage of humanity. So it is our responsibility to, to preserve them in good condition and to show them, um, I mean, for all future generations and to display them for local and international community in this way. Thank you very much, uh, Natasha, for what I think was a very, um, very inspiring way to end this, this uh, conversation. Um, I think we ran out of time, so please join me in thanking Ismo, Karim and Natasha for uh, this interesting um, roundtable discussion. And if I'm not mistaken, I can pass the floor now to Sophie. I think you are not mistaken. I think you are uh, right on time. A few minutes left for me to uh, pick up kind of where uh, my colleague Antonella Fresa left off. And if that's okay with you, I'd like to share for just a few minutes my screen as well. And I hope this is working. What I wanted to um, conclude with, with regards to Pagode, the Europeana China project, is telling you a little bit about uh, what you, as um, a specialist or an enthusiast um, in the field of uh, Chinese cultural heritage or missionary cultural heritage, in this case related to China, could um, go and explore. Because this is not a project that we're doing for ourselves, of course, we are doing it for uh, a wide user community, which we hope to um, kind of infuse with our enthusiasm about the beautiful collections that we've been exploring in the course of the project. 
one of our goals, uh, which actually we have already reached uh, about half a year before our, our deadline, is to establish a dedicated China hub on Europeana. So visit the homepage europeana.eu and henceforth you'll be able to um, find a dedicated spot there. And you see the URL here in my slide where all the editorials that we produce in the course of the project and beyond, of course, because we will not let this topic go um, once the project term is over, you will find everything nicely clustered here and it's a little bit addictive. So you'll, you'll start exploring these beautiful images and, and these intriguing stories. And I hope you'll, um, you'll keep on going and you'll return for more later because this is a page that keeps growing week after week. What you could do is explore our blog posts. These are slightly longer uh, articles, a bit of bite. They have a bit of a bite to them. Uh, a nice selection of, let's say, a variety of heritage materials. Huh? You can see artifacts, uh, paintings, pictures, maps, um, texts and translations, and so on, around some well-chosen topics that we saw emerging from the different collections we are working with. This is, for instance, uh, one of our first blogs about Empress Chi uh, the women, uh, the Empress Dowager that uh, ruled China for a good couple of decades. What you could also do is go for uh, visual impact. So less text, but a lot of hand-chosen pictures are united in our galleries and we've now got a nice um, variety of them already available. Um, as you can see, some dedicated to uh, uh, botanical illustrations, mandarins of China, rice cultivation. Here we try to combine uh, several collections. So we uh, do not stick to one provider only. We really search for um, in themes that emerge from multiple collections as they are displayed in Europeana. Yin and Yang is another one of those topics in which we see uh, the East and the West touching upon each other's traditions and cultural understandings. And these are the kinds of themes that we like to explore and that we like to touch upon in a project such as Pagode. The Chinese junk is another one, eh, the very iconic uh, shape of the sail that has inspired so many Western uh, artists. We've tracked back to its humble origins and its very real uh, origins in the warfare and trade history of China. What you can then uh, finally do is to dive straight into some of our partner and associate partner collections via the browse entry points. These are manually compiled um, queries that lead you directly into some very specifically flavored batches of images that we've um, brought together in the scope of Pagode. I just give a few examples. The colored glass slides of uh, Carl Simon, provided by United Archives. Carl Simon was um, um, a cultural heritage enthusiast of his time, so early 20th century, who gave lectures for all kinds of audiences using glass slides that he compiled himself. And the special thing is that our partner United Archives has not only bought all these glass slides, but also inherited the actual presentations that Carl Simon delivered with them. So he made it a live performance in which he showed the slides and uh, to unfolded the story to go with them. And what you have here is his uh, complete Asia collection. So some about Japan, some about China. You'll also see that in some cases he confused uh, Japan and China, which of course is uh, an interesting instance in cultural history and historiography in and of itself. The other one that I skipped over uh, is this one uh, with etchings taken, taken from a book by uh, John Thompson. You can find the picture collection of Thompson in Europeana as well. And we found this etchings collection to be uh, an, an eye-opening addition to those images. We're also planning to release an exhibition. This is a larger scale editorial and a book to go with it. So as you can see, we are exploring in this uh, post-pandemic era, 
new ways to bring the digital and physical together. In this case, we will probably not go for a physical exhibition, but for a digital one on Europeana. But a book definitely is going to be physical and it's going, it's intended to be a guide that provides you an alternative pathway through a digital exhibition. We're uh, in full flux of uh, bringing this publication to life and in a few months, uh, it will be an addition to our Pagoda output. Apart from this dedicated hub with all its editorials, we're also adding a Chinese flavor to existing Europeana collections because of course we want this slice of heritage to become as integrated with the broader scope of uh, Europeana collections as possible. At the same time, we're not only adding material, we're not only suggesting topics, but we're also trying to improve metadata so as to empower other curators, researchers, students, uh, educators to make the best possible use of all the material that is already there. Let's not forget that Europeana already holds 53 million, probably even more by now, uh, digital records. Sometimes the big problem is that the records are there, but it's so difficult to discover them because the metadata are slightly faulty or not rich enough or not multilingual enough or not informative enough. We have now um, artificial intelligence that can be of great help in um, adding more keywords, um, working with linked open data and just bringing out the potential that is there in these uh, heritage collections or these legacy uh, collections as we call them. But what we also do is we add manual tags. We don't always need artificial intelligence. We also have some very specific human intelligence that can be of use here. And this is why we're employing the Crowd Heritage Platform, this uh, developed by the colleagues at the National Technical University of Athens. And I invite you all to uh, go and visit crowdheritage.eu because um, while you can see here that one of our crowdsourcing campaigns devoted to scenes and people from China. It has already been completed. Eh? You can see at the bottom of my slide, the progress is 100%. But we have a second one that is still open. And I will come to that in, um, in half a minute, because I wanted to show you here the beautiful batches of pictures, among which one provided by Finnish Heritage Agency, uh, that you can annotate simply by clicking on a collection, choosing a picture, and then adding a tag, which you select from uh, a curated thesaurus, such as I did here. I typed in tools, I clicked tools, it got added to the list of annotations, and at the same time, I upvoted the annotations that other people added and that I found really relevant. This is the second campaign, the Chinese artifacts. It's a little bit more specialized. So should this be your field of expertise, then you're the person that we're looking for. We are currently at 36% of completing this campaign. It's going to remain open until the end of July. So if you have, um, let's say an hour of lunch to spare and you want to give it a try, I'm warning you, it's also slightly addictive you can work yourself up all the way to the top of the leaderboard and gain yourself a bronze, silver or gold medal. So what we wanted to do is to end this uh, pagoda part of the session with a call to action. If you can visit crowdheritage.eu, EN China, register or log in, add text or upvote those that others have added and help us crush those targets. Finally, um, keep uh, track of our new missionary collections that are coming, because this is, of course, the reason why we are here today in this panel session. We have our colleagues at Museo Virasto who have a dedicated uh, collection of missionary origin that's uh, coming to Europeana. The colleagues at Leiden University, as well as Wereldkulturen, have uh, books on the one hand and paintings and artifacts on the other that both testify to the miss missionary origin of many of these uh, China collection in, collections in the Low Countries. 
And finally, uh, Cardoc has uh, selected um, uh, a collection by um, uh, a missionary called Vance. Uh, Jonas, you can correct me, or Karim, uh, if I'm pronouncing it wrong. But it's a, a quite a unique and an attractive collection that has been handpicked uh, by the Cardo colleagues. Thank you so much for that. And we're expecting to see it appear on Europeana somewhere in the next few weeks or months maximum. Keep track of that. We are going to frame these new materials, these new resources with a dedicated blog post that I am expecting also in summertime, July or more, more probably August of this year. And voila, we are very proud of what we've been able to do so far. Definitely, this network is always open to be uh, extended. Uh, you're more than welcome to join in or to suggest to us partners that could be of interest to a project such as Pagoda. That was it for me. Uh, find us via Europeana. We have a project website that you can add access via photoconsortium.net. We have an online showcase on digitalmixculture.net and we are at your fingertips if you email at Antonella or myself at kunewerking.be. Voila, Jonas, back to you. I ran out of words, so um, I think I can just conclude this session and give the word to the organizers for maybe uh, giving some household information and informing you about the rest of, of the day. But thank you, Sophie, and thank you, all of the speakers in this session.